Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is, my goodness, July 18th already, Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans, and this is the level one recording for lesson three. So, ah, oh, fantastic, very good. So, you know, one of the first things I want to start off with is a review of some of the wonderful homeworks that people have been t turning in and tuning in. I've got them all organized down here. Let me just pull these up. And then, wait, so you're okay. You're going to see me making squinty faces for a second. Then I'll, I'll pull these all up and we'll look at all of them together. And um, hold on. Let me do one thing at a time, too. There's a lot to look at. Okay, good. So also, I know I make squinty squirrely faces. Um, <laughs> I make funny faces while I'm focusing. I'm going to show some homeworks. Thank you so much. Everyone who is doing your homework, huge thumbs up to you. This little guy is so funny. Um, you're never too young to lasagna, too. He's, he's doing his own version of the dance. Some people had challenges with figuring out how to do the measurements. Some people, I'll show you as we walk through. What, what I'm trying to say is um, I'm sharing a variety of different images from different students. Please don't, don't be insulted or whatever if I haven't chosen yours and this isn't about that type of a thing. I wanted to show various different approaches that people have been doing because these are all valid, wonderful, unique learning approaches, just like if we were learning the piano or something like that. So like I keep saying, like I'm trying to um, help encourage you to learn how to draw the map so that you can eventually read the map too. So let me just show you some of these lovely assignments here. Okay, we don't need to be seeing this, sorry. Now you can see, okay, good. So again, once again, uh, and also make sure you can see me. Great appreciation for everyone who gave me permission to show your assignments. So, hold on, let me scroll through so that you can get an idea of what some of these are looking like. So this one over here, I specifically wanted to show you. So this one is done with, uh, colored pencils that turn into watercolor. So first she did, the, the student did a drawing with the lines and then went over it with kind of um, clear water that made these colors come in. So what I'm trying to show is all of these are like the same basic skeleton, same basic armature. That's what I'm teaching you, that that is, let's play a little music, that's like the chord structure. My music's not on, when you, think, when you think you're playing the piano and it's not actually on, the chord structure. It's still not on. I wonder why that piano is not making any actual noises. Well, don't worry. I won't fiddle with it too much. Okay. Pretend I just played some music on the piano. We'll figure out why it's not exactly working right now anyway. Basic armature, basic chord structure of what we're doing. But then there's the question of all of these different ways of how do you as an artist, oh, here's the basic line drawing that the student did, and then what it looks like when you put the color, watercolor on top of it different aesthetic choices in ways of presenting the same information. And so you can see in these two images too, this one over here, this one over here, these are two different students who are presenting the same information through their own unique biological filters. This is what this is all about. Same basic chord structure but coming through different musicians. Being One is played through a cello, one is played through a tuba. This is totally wonderful and great. This is my, my intention for this assignment. And when I'm um, assessing your work, I'm assessing the accuracy of your math and your proportions and whether your colors are accurate too. So that's what it is. It's so it, I'm, I would never say like, you didn't make the right artistic choices. That's not what this is about. And you can also then begin to understand a little bit more my work. Wait, wait, wait. let's see if I can move this and move it. There you go. So wait, wait. So now I want to show you this was good. So this example of this uh, from this student um, did the measurements by folding the paper. So that's why I wanted to show this as an example. So I don't know if you can see kind of along here, there are creases in the graph paper. So what this student did was more of a mechanical approach and not an intellectual math approach. Again, everybody has their own unique learning style. This is why I'm showing you what people have turned in. So you can see this big giant red circle here was the first increment that then the paper got folded in half. And then this midpoint, I don't know if you can even see where I'm, where I'm jiggling my cursor down here, this midpoint was created. And then look, here's folding it into fourths. That's another midpoint, that's another midpoint. So this is another approach, a more mechanical, less intellectual approach. When I say mechanical, I mean like based in like the, the actual material world, not just based in an assessment 
uh, of your mind. So I'm, I, I, and pardon me also if my brain does not connect with my mouth. I'm stumbling here, but I think you know what I'm talking about. This is just a very plain drawing. I think that shows the, the structure and the armature very well. And this was another person's work that I wanted to show. There's two images that this is, uh, there you go, you can see both of these. Um, these are cutouts. So I think this is another lovely approach to learning these shapes and these proportions. This is a big giant circle of like red paper or material and then smaller circles. So it's a fun way to be able to um, play with layering, play with um, design in the same way that I, this is how I do my paintings. I have circle templates. So I have actual physical circles that I can move around and lay out and everything. It's kind of, it's a way of thinking with shapes. Um, just like if you were a, a chef and you were going to make a soup you can write that recipe. You can write like this many cloves of garlic and this much this and this much this, but it's very, very different than when you actually have the ingredients and you actually taste it, you actually play around with ingredients. This is like doing more of that direct approach of playing around with ingredients. So there's that and there's this also, you can see kind of like cut, cutouts made out of material being stacked up in different ways. And let me show you this. This is another cool one, so this is good. When you guys, if you haven't seen it yet, I have an old animation that I did with a very simple animation software that ends up looking almost exactly like this. The, 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 hold on a second, let me drink a bit of water. The video on YouTube is called The Conception of the Flying Rainbow Lasagna. And if you check it out, because uh, I used a, a program where I, all I could do is make flat circles and make them move, I couldn't make spheres, but a lot of, um, I was able to convey a lot of the information just by doing these kind of layered flat circles like this. So that is a beautiful um, exploration of the shape in that way. And then here, that's just the primary shape with all the circles lined up with, the, the, we would say like on a, a, a convergence point that is on the edge getting that out there, and I think this is one of, the, one of the other ones. There you go. Okay, cool. Very, just excellent student work. Here, we go back to my face. Thank you so much, participants. Thank you so much, excellent students. And also, some people wrote to me so apologetically. They're like, I'm sorry that my homework is so messy. No, please, stop apologizing immediately, because this is just like saying, uh, I'm sorry that I did not speak French perfectly with a perfect accent on the first day of class. Like, this is like how you learn. The, the important thing is that you understand that your homeworks are an exploration of learning these different chords, these different structures. And I appreciate it if you, if you, you know, want to redraw it so that it's neat and send, it, send me a perfectly neat thing. But please do not apologize for your learning process, that this is what it is. This, we are all like, young people or little infants or little whatever artists in training that begin with these very basic drawings and then the more that you do it it's just like anything the more that you do it you gain a facility in it and you can do it in very very easily so okay mini man says sorry for asking again we'll, we'll go through this he's got specific questions still don't understand this the violet is 12 divided by 7 that's 1.7142 not 1.68, like you say in your video. How do I get 1.68? Thank you. Because on my little thing, where's my little thing? I had it cut to 1.68 because the size of my, when I add in my pen point on the edge, the pen point makes it a little tiny bit bigger. So I have my templates cut for an allowance of a tiny amount of pen point. So that's why I make my actual physical template is like 1.68 knowing that it's going to get rounded up closer to 1.7 when I actually put a pencil point or a pen point around it. So that's where that is. I appreciate your desire or intention to be very accurate. So in these homework drawings that you're beginning, thank you, Minnie Man, that you're beginning, um, it is not as essential that you make it, because the difference between 1.68 and 1.7, that's 0.02 inches. That is a very, very small amount. But however, if you are drawing a painting like this, I'll move it a little bit so you can see it better. Here, wait. There we go. So if you were drawing a painting like this, little tiny um, incremental um, um, errors add up a lot. So that's what it, it would be much more, it would be much more of an issue. And that's why I have my circle templates cut so that they have that little extra amount of wiggle room around them because otherwise um, my circles would not fit together perfectly like right here where they're supposed to fit together perfectly. So that's more of a question of like when I say the mechanics, like the engineering of taking something that is a concept 
and expressing it effectively in the real world. So hold on, let me do this too. And wait, 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 let me put this away. Talk, do one thing at a time, one thing at a time. That relates to music. We're talking about the difference between the abstract and the experienced. So the abstract would be, this is like, here's the musical formula, I'm writing one plus one equals two, or here is the exact tuning of what this length of string should be in order to create a particular sound. I don't know why my sounds aren't working. I, I mean, I can't fiddle with things right now. Um, but the truth is, sometimes you can do the perfect calculations. This string needs to be exactly this length to make exactly this sound, and it doesn't make exactly that sound. And that's because you're actually working with the atmosphere, friction, humidity, all of these other little tiny variables that make things come out a little bit different when you try to make them happen in reality. So in my inner world, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no need for allowing for a pencil point, right? Everything fits together perfectly and it's similar to if you were just doing a computer design where it's just pixels and there's no actual paint, there's no actual ink. But if you want to make an actual painting or if you want to make something actually happen in reality, then you have to take into account things like the atmosphere and humidity and the, shi the size of molecules and things like that. So then you have to be a real artist to be able to figure out how do I get these things across in a way that is accurate, even understanding that there are distortions that are inherent in the uh, experience of being embedded in reality. Okay, thank you. Oh, Daniela, ah, blah, 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 that's great. I understand, thank you so much. So Daniela also sent me some questions and uh, she was only here for a moment. I will answer those questions um, later in the recording and she can catch those later. Uh, and I said, because she had emailed those questions to me and I usually say, let me answer the questions in class because they're good questions and I'm sure many other people you know, wonder or think about these things and would like to learn from it too. So we'll uh, talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Um, Let's get going on the actual level one material. This is all about the shape of time. Oh, and where's my little thing? So we'll also do a little bit of recap because lessons one and two have all been about focusing on this shape and electromagnetism and solenoids and um, how this shape is a microcosm and macrocosm through various aspects of both the material and biological realm. And all of this is precursor to be able to understand this, right? So we're also, we're gonna talk about the energy pathways of how energy flows around this shape. But first, I wanna to rewind to last week. I wanna go back and do a review of when I spoke about building the 11 dimensions, referencing Bra Rob Bryanton's work. So Bryanton didn't invent these 10 dimensions, but he did a very good uh, exposition like these are like math concepts basically. He did some very lovely animations and very, uses very lovely analogies to be able to get across these ideas. Point, line, plane, the idea of beginning with a, a point and then expanding it into a line and then lining up many lines into a plane. So what I'm going to do is review of that, but then what I'm also going to do is relate that to how we build this shape. So first, when I'm giving you these images, mostly I'm showing you squares. But I don't want you to think in squares. Don't be square. <laughs> There's so many things in our society. Don't be a square, man. Be cool. Um, no, wait, wait, wait. Where's the little? Yeah, that's what I want. Good. And I want to have a pen. I'm showing you all these things that are making you think that time is a square. Like if I say we start off with a point, and that's the zeroth dimension, then we expand it into a line, and that's the first dimension, and then I line up many lines next to one another, and that creates a time plane, right? And I keep drawing it as a square or a rectangle through the magic of perspective. You understand that's a flat piece of paper. I don't want you, excellent members of this class, to begin to presume that, oh, time is a flat playing card, you know, like a flat square playing card. It's not, it's all rounded and circular. So I'm going to show you how this shape is created and reference what we learned last week. So just to, you know, um, um, recap, because also this is just like learning a song. You learn by repetition, we all learn through repetition. So we're gonna play one of your favorite little jazzy tunes again, which is how to build the dimensions, beginning with the zeroth dimension, that's infinity, that's the presence of everything, that is this central convergence point at the center of this sculpture over here. Um, and the most amazing feat of consciousness was when this little zeroth dimension, that is the accumulated, super dense, overlappingness of everythingness, decided one day to expand itself and just have a part of itself not be here. Now wait, first I have to tell this story in the proper way. Wait, let's get a color. Where I'm scribbling in blue 
in this story where I'm scribbling in blue, none of this exists. None of this exists. I can't actually scribble there. It doesn't exist. None of that exists. There is no dimension around that. This is what it's like to be the zeroth dimension. Everything that exists is there. There's nothing outside of there. This is a really critical leap for your own understanding because the most amazing thing was what happened when this little dot had to somehow imagine that some aspect of itself wasn't there, but was instead over here or over here or over here. Any of those places that is not there. And that was the most amazing leap that the little dot ever made. So let's make, here's a little spot. It thought, what if part of me is actually not over here with me, but is instead in a different spot over there? And that's the invention of the first dimension. And that crucial leap, which is basically, it, it, it's a, a leap at 90 degrees or perpendicular into the next highest dimension. But in from a dot or a circle, that could be a leap in any direction. It could have been a leap out here. It could have been a leap over here. All of these are perfectly acceptable leaping directions. But then once you've established that initial leaping direction, you have to go 90 degrees to that. So that's the first dimension. What's 90 degrees to the first dimension? It's the second dimension. So that would be going in this direction, right? That's a 90 degree angle. Boom. You all just did math. You all just did math. Yes. So we line up all of the timelines of the second dimension perpendicular. Sorry, sorry. They're, these lines are parallel to the initial line, but their direction for expansion is perpendicular. So you can see that I'm expanding in this direction that is perpendicular to the original line. And this is what makes a plane. But we're starting to understand that when I make that plane, it's actually a flat plane like this. Everything is a circular hula hoop, all right? So now we've got a plane full of timelines. And that is the second dimension. And all of these numbers have to do with how many in, um, pieces of information it takes to describe the position of a point in any of these places. So hey, here's the anything in the zeroth dimension. It does not require any amount of information to say that your position is there because all of us are there. This is the big takeaway of my whole entire class. All of us are there right now. I'm there right now. You're there right now. Everything, my dog is there right now. My tree is there right now. The orange juice I drank for breakfast is there right now. Everything is there right now. You can't not be there. Everything is there. But then we are also on this journey of being in other places too. But that understanding that everything is there right now, it's a singularity. That understanding is what allows you to perform the maneuver known as the flying rainbow lasagna. Um, one position, one, one point of information to say, oh, there is a piece of, uh, there's a position that's right there one piece of information. And then we need two pieces of information to describe, like let's say I'm over here. Well, now I have to know about the X axis and I have to know about the Y axis. So I have to have two variables to say, I'm at the corner of street A and street B, right? Now I have to actually say where I am. And then when we add in the next layer of reality, then we have to have three pieces of information. And that gives us third dimension. Look, I'm now adding up all of these planes into a box. Box is the third dimension. Please refer to my thumbnail. Look at this line that goes from this corner up to the edge of your screen over here, this line that goes behind my head over here. I live in a box, in a third dimensional box. Wait, let's finish drawing this box over here. And this box is, it's the third dimension because it requires three pieces of information to describe the position of a you know, point in there. So we have to have an X, a Y, and a Z information to be able to say where is that X located in these three dimensions. So science describes also that um, these uh, dimensions are spatial dimensions. They describe the material world and what we sense with our five senses as the space around us, right? But the rest of the dimensions going up, science describes as referring to time. They are not spatial dimensions, they are time dimensions. So now this blue box, that's a box of time. First of all, I'm gonna draw this down here. And from here on in, this is all recap from last week. But I know I go very, very fast, and so I'm going over it again. This is this. This is a cube of time. The various possibilities and probabilities and timelines, right? but it doesn't move through time until we make a timeline. 
It's a flat static object that only flashes in reality for one second, and then it's gone until or unless we make a series of cubes. And that's what this is. These are a series of cubes, getting a different color here. And these cubes are tied together with integument. So first of all, I use this word all the time. Aurora, what the heck is integument? It is like a system in your body of stuff that ties together stuff. It's like your skin and your tendons and your, your gristle that holds all of your guts together. Uh, this is your integument. So we have these static moments of time that is like the slice of pie of time that has been cut into the smallest little pie slices that you possibly can cut it into, the smallest little thinnest micrometer thick slices and still call it pie. That's what these individual time boxes are. They are little tiny morsels or crumbs of time. And just like in an old fashioned movie at the movie theater, now most movies are done on a digital screen. Digital screens are different than movie films, film strip. Digital screen has like a, a refresh rate that goes up from the, from the top down to the bottom, kind of like this. But um, uh, old fashioned uh, analog film has static images that flash. They just flash and they flash at a particular rate. Oh, we gotta mute y'all, hold on a second. I have to mute you. You're supposed to be mute upon entry. Go back. 26 frames per second. So 26 little flashes of static images per second in your neurological perception means that you tie together those static images, those little blue train cars, into an actual movement. And this um, phenomenon in perception is called persistence of vision, not to be confused with Salvador Dali's painting of melted clocks, which is called persistence of memory. Persistence of vision, this is a phenomena of our perception and interpretation of reality, that you can take static images that are not moving at all, but if you flash them at the right rate in front of our eyes, we will bring the integument, where's my thing, with our mind, with our perception. We build these little springs in between each moment. This is part of quantum observership. This is part of the paintbrush of your mind. This is part of the magic of who you are and what you're doing all the time. And it's being exploited quite a lot. Please claim it. Please claim it and begin to paint beautiful things with the paintbrush of your mind. Um, so we have this integument here that is also the end result of the dance of your DNA. So once again, it's a perception that is a mag magical or a phenomenon of perception where you take static images. So the static image is so blah, blah, not to talk about zoetrope. What's a zoetrope? Zoetrope is a wheel of life. I don't want to take this time to write it out. Z-O-E-T-R-O-P-E -E, that has slits cut in it. This is like ancient animation. This is from like the 1500s. And then they would put a film strip inside of the, of the bin and spin it around. And the, the slits create that same flickering experience that makes it look like the horse is really running. And this is just like if you ever did this on the edge of your math book, because you're so bored in your math class, you're like, draw pictures, draw these little stick figures on the edge of your pages. And when you flip through it, then it looks like the little guy is moving. This is the phenomenon that we're talking about. So this is also relevant in terms of the chakras of your body. We are all looking at static moments of time. Little frozen moments of time, but we have these chakras or energy centers that are constantly whirling and swirling in front of us. I know sometimes I get a little bit silly, just bear with me. Uh, a little bit uh, swirling and swirling in front of us and that's what creates the flicker rate. Just like this uh, Zoe trope over here, this wheel of life, it is the whirling and swirling action of our chakras themselves that give us the experience of time and that whirling and swirling action is analogous to the dance of our DNA. So this is only the third lesson of this particular installment, but I talk about this all the time in this class, get used to it. The DNA is not a flat static object. It is constantly dancing, moving, twirling, twisting, unfolding, folding again, uh, enzymatically snipping itself, un un uncurling like a this, recurling like scrolls, it does all these different things. And it's literally that movement of your DNA that propels you through time, that makes you jump. Let's get a different color so you can see what I'm talking about here. 
that makes you jump from this moment right now, this train car of reality, into this train car of reality, and then into this one, and then into this one. This is how you move through time. This is like big stuff, guys, big stuff. Just noting that these are profound ideas that I'm describing to you here and that these are highly empowering to know about. So when I talk, call them little train cars of reality, that's also a reference I kind of figured out with one student one semester to an old Twilight Zone. This was like the 1980s Twilight Zone version where uh, these people get kind of unstuck from time and they start to see behind the scenes that there's these little guys that go around um, kind of like building each steam each train car and they hop into each train car but these guys they didn't hop at the right moment so they kind of kept on seeing the train cars when they were still uh uh in the in the mo in the process of being built so that is how uh this is the, the cultural shorthand that i'm trying to use the idea that this is a train of time this is also the fourth dimension what we just drew right now is the fourth dimension so this is, the, these are the three spatial dimensions that describe space, but now we're into the dimension that describes time. I've got one room over here with one box, with one person sitting in it. But we've been talking about this stuff for about 29 minutes, and I'm not in the same body that I was in 29 minutes ago, and neither are any of you. We all jumped into our various bodies at the micro min minutia level. When I say what I'm talking about, like, not one time a second, but like millions of times a second. That, and that's what our DNA is doing. Your DNA doing all of your little DNA dances. So just when you're not, when you're not even flying your lasagna yet, just at the level of DNA replication, when you split your DNA apart and there's these little super coiling, um, they, basically these little apparatuses that are subcellular um, spin at a rate that is even faster than a jet engine. You have these little very, very, very fast things that are happening at the subcellular level of your DNA. Those movements are what propel you through time. When you don't have those movements anymore, that is when you die. That is when you die, you're gonna die. This is, let's, let's draw what is dying. Dying means that there are no more movements here. There is no more green integument that makes you jump from this moment over here to this moment over here. Look, you don't jump. Look, I'm over here, I'm over here, I'm over here, and then, I don't go nowhere. Wait, 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 I should say it like this. I started off over here. I jumped through time. I jumped through time. And then, oh, I didn't keep on jumping through time. That's called being dead. And I'm going to relate that to the time vortex. But at first, I want to continue with the... So bookmark in your mind that I just said, oh, look, I'm dead because I didn't jump. Make the quantum leap. So the quantum leap, everyone. This is a quantum leap. This right here, quantum, that means you've got to do it all at once. You can't do half a jump. You cannot do half a jump that is not allowed in this world. You have to do a whole jump only. That's why this guy can't get here. He can only do half a jump. Um, so uh, bookmark these concepts when I talk to you about the lower quadrant of this that is called the time vortex that is coming up. But we got to go on to what is the fifth dimension. So the fourth dimension, that's this, what I just drew over here. Wait, let's not... Let me crap this up too much. Fourth dimension is this timeline over here. And then the fifth dimension is what happens when, when we take many, many, multiple fourth dimensional timelines and line them up next to each other because we've got the point line plane. So now we're making a plane again, except now that you guys are getting to be super experts of the type of language that we use in this class, you understand that this is not actually shaped like a flat playing card. It's actually shaped like this over here. And now you're starting to understand, like, wait a minute, those circles are exactly what this thing is shaped like. Now you're getting it. Okay, fantastic. So the fifth dimension is also not a literal place. Like if I use the analogy, the fourth dimension is like a line of French bread where we're starting off, here's one end of the bread that is birth, and here's one end of the bread and that is death, and then all of this the delicious doughy middle in the middle. Um, you cannot take that analogy literally in order to say that the fifth dimension is like a shelf on the bakery store where we have all of these timelines lined up like breadsticks lined up next to each other. That is not the fifth dimension. And this is big because a lot of people, they're very loosey-goosey. They're all like, I'm in the fifth dimension. I'm in the fifth dimension. Like, you know, like send me money. And I'm like, wait, 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 what exactly do you mean here? So the answer is like, we are all constantly in the fifth dimension. Like these dimensional selves that I'm describing to you, these are part of 
higher dimensional layers of self that we have. We have all these higher dimensional layers of self. The question is, are you intentionally in control of them? Or like, are you like a baby? Like, wow, well, like I wave my arms around. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm hitting into things. Like I'm hitting myself. Like that is what most people's experience of the higher dimensional reality is like. Spastic limbs or out of control limbs. That's your mind. That's anxiety. When you have anxiety, that's like you're waving around your limbs and your arms and your legs in a higher dimensional reality of time, totally effing everything up and you just don't even know what you're doing. And it's not your fault. Like I'm trying to say like, it ain't your fault. You got to learn how to get beyond this. And this is learning about this is part of the way that you get beyond this. Fifth dimensional stuff means, um, uh, I would say gaining control of one's higher dimensional limbs gaining control of one's manifestation mechanisms and anatomy so that you're actually making the events of reality in the shape, the size and shape that you want, not out of control sizes and shapes that you don't want. So um, what is the fifth dimension? It is the mixing um, material in the back of the bakery, the giant mixer where you make the dough and flour and water. That's the fifth dimension. I also, oh, and this is my wonderful raw cannabis juice here. Hold on a second. I often use the analogy too about um, the way that our perception and quantum observership works. We have ovens in front of our eyes. And please refer to the full story, my little nursery, nursery hour, story time hour. I have a video called Reality Creation where I talk about like story time. And it's fun. Like I, I use these ways as like fun analogies to talk about heavy scientific concepts. Imagine that everything that's around you is not actually stuff. It's just a bunch of dough, you know, like batter, like cake batter. And uh, you, when you look around at all the dough, you've actually got ovens in front of your eyes, like some kind of ray guns or something like that. And every place where you are looking, you are cooking the dough of possibilities into actual experience bread of reality. That is very analogous to what is going on. So the fifth dimension is the uncollapsed, the world of uncollapsed waveforms of possibilities and probabilities. And the sixth dimension, so it's right five here. And again, I go over this a lot. We'll do it again. Just stick with me. We'll go over this many, many times. Sixth dimension is creating, can you see this? This is a different color. A cube out of possibilities. And so what we're starting to do now is creating, if you imagine that the fifth dimension is like a tapestry, now we've got a, a layer, like a cube of tapestries that are all together, uh, stuck on top of each other. And these are events. So now what would happen if I take an event that's like, this is a, a timeline, it's like a needle pulling thread. I always do this Julie Andrews joke, a needle pulling thread. So we're sewing a needle pulling thread through the layers of time. And what would this be like? This would be like if we had an event over here that maybe on one timeline is a huge nuclear conflagration but maybe it, there's timeline bleed through in these various layers of the time tapestry as you go down, maybe down here, there would be something like a miniature fractal version, not a whole giant nuclear conflagration, but maybe a problem with the nuclear reactor. And then if you go even more distant in the time field through even fewer lay, more layers, tiny, tiny bleed through, it could be like, oh, just a, a truck overturned and a, a little bit of radiation leaked down on, you know, route number five or something like that. Um, so this is timeline bleed through the understanding, like don't throw your interdimensional trash in my yard. <laughs> These are what aliens would say to you guys that, cause this is what I'm talking about. When you start to play with firecrackers, then you're affecting the entire neighborhood. You're not just blowing off your own fingers. So things like nuclear bombs and nuclear reactors gone horribly awry doesn't just affect your little neighborhood here on earth in this time field. It affects everyone you get timeline bleed through. So the higher dimensionals and extra dimensionals and extraterrestrials are like, hey, stop throwing your trash in my dimension. No more timeline bleed through. Stop it with the nuclear crap. So um, this is also to understand the interconnectedness of your various lives. So again, various lives sewn together with the needle pulling thread. And here we have several different lives that all converge through the time vortices at the central convergence point, starting to understand that I'm using these cubes and flat planes as an analogy to show you what is actually spherical and circular in its energy movement. That's the sixth dimension. And the sixth dimension can also be considered what happens when you not only see the entire movie script of reality laid out before you, but you also begin to see all the edits 
all of the ways. Oh, first it was like this, then they changed it to this, then they changed it to a romantic comedy, then they changed it to a tragedy, then they changed it to a monster movie, then they changed it to this, and here are all the alternate endings, and here's the director's cut. That's what the sixth dimension is like. And again, this is a cube. The sixth dimension here, I just drew this to cube. So here, let's draw, uh, here's a sixth dimensional cube that starts off as the first train car of reality. It also starts off as like the point, the zeroth dimension, and now we draw higher dimensional cubes next to it, and this seventh dimension, seventh dimension is a line, that's not good seven, is a line of cubes that go off in this direction and um, contains more multiple changing aspects of reality. So when you start to become a higher dimensional being, you start to see like the music is always changing. Like it was this, but now it is this. This is why prophecies that you make at breakfast become a moot point by lunchtime if you fly in rainbow lasagna. Because every time you do this, you're shaking up the salad dressing of reality. All the things that you thought were going to happen, like, wait, wait, this was supposed to happen over here, but that ain't gonna happen anymore because now we are now living this version of reality. So also, this should tell you and inform you that unless you are talking with a real super duper expert who is giving you some kind of long range visionary or or oracle predictions about the future, it ain't worth nothing. Like save your money, spend it on a sandwich. You know that because they're what they're telling you is like only relevant for a very brief window of time, and then everything changes and shifts. So if someone said, "Oh, oh, oh, I see the man in your dreams, and he's got a beard and you know an earring through his nose," and then that turns out not to be true, you go to them and they're like, "Oh, but reality changed. When I predicted that, that was accurate, but now it's not accurate anymore because now we're in this version of reality down here and now you know your man your man for dreams is blonde and you know dressed like a viking like whatever that is no longer a valid prediction but you paid that guy five bucks for that prediction save your money like learn to just see your own future so the seventh dimension is a line and the eighth dimension would be a plane made out of these complex time cubes right a plane but we now know that the plane is not actually flat and shaped like that it's actually shaped like this and then we stack up many, many planes. But stack, what would stacking up many, many planes look like? You guys are smart. It would start to look like a torus, like this, what I've got right over here, even though I know that's a really messy drawing of it. And then, so this, this um, endless stacking would continue onwards. Wait, let me go. I can't see the chat when I'm in there. Let me drink. Let me check out the chat. Let me answer questions. I know I'm moving fast. This is lasagna time. We're moving fast. Robert Fenton, thank you for this beautiful comment. He says, so the zeroth dimension created a fractal universe. Yes, yes, yes. That is absolutely accurate. That is what we are experiencing here. Eleanor says, so the first and second dimensions are out of time. Third dimension brings time about. According to science and math description here on Earth right now, the first, second, and third dimensions are spatial, meaning that they describe things in the material space. But then upward from there, the rest of the dimensions are not visible. They are non-visible. This I always play jokes with people when they come to my studio. I'm like, show me the first dimension. Show me the second dimension. Show me the third dimension. Then I say like, okay, now point to the fourth dimension. You can't do it because the fourth dimension is time. Fourth dimension and above is time. So you would have to be like, point to a watch. But nobody wears a watch anymore. So point to a clock or something like that. So it's a trick question. I don't play with people. At, like I don't, I'm, not, I'm not messing around. Um, but yes, fourth dimension and higher, these are not perceptible to the five senses unless we like see something moving over time. So science has a huge challenge with time because it can recognize and acknowledge that time exists. However, it cannot weigh time. How much does an hour weigh? You know, it is very, very challenging to um, demonstrate the substance of time and um, understand and measure time in that way. So science can certainly like build a clock that measures the passage of time, but science is not yet adept at understanding these maps of time in the time field. This is the problem. They are perceptible with your higher dimensional vision, not with your regular freaking human eyeballs. Mini Man says, so time space is an animation and we are too stupid to get it and think it is real because our DNA tricks us. Semi, yes, I love your comment. Not because our DNA tricks us, because that is what we are experiencing. Um, I, I think Mini Man is coming more from the um, um, response, from the emotional response of like, like, 
A, it ain't that much fun to be here. Like, A, this is a bunch of crap down here. There's a lot of crap down here. It's a hacked system. So the way that the system was originally designed by the great composer, the great conductor, it was not designed to be full of suffering and torment and abuse and to have horrible out of tune music. That was not the intention for us to be here and for us to experience. So more like a sense of um, cunning uh, artistry. You know, when I make something like this, I say like I'm an artist and I'm trying in whatever cunning ways I can to make something that's an approximation of something else that you can't see and sense otherwise. Like that's it, like I make stuff the best I can. Um, but no one's gonna be like, Aurora, I'm disappointed because I tried to eat this. It was not really lasagna. It's like, yes, that's right, it's a sculpture. I made it as best I could, it's not actually edible. I think that's how reality is. That this is not some cruel joke where it's like, I made you live in an artificial reality. It's not even really moving. You're adding the movement to it. Blah, ha, 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 ha. It's not like that. It's not like you're being bitch slapped by the cosmos or anything like that. It's more a sense of that it's pretty miraculous system, you know, that, that all of these things having to hook together and fit together in order to have this experience of being here. The experience of being in a biological cellular body and being conscious and being able to perceive. And the level two stuff, I'm going to get more into our actual system of perception and how that is dualistic and how this is going beyond duality. But that it, it's, part of, it's part of the answer that I'm giving to you now, that this was not designed to be some kind of a cruel cosmos, like suffering. It's not like you're, you're not supposed to have to suffer in order to learn. Our bodies are not inherently flawed. Things were distorted and diminished. So um, I just don't agree with the flavor of the assessment, like, hey, this place is just an, an animation and I'm too stupid. Like, no, this place is an animation and you're a freaking artist. You're the animator making it happen. That is what science describes as quantum observership. And that's what separates you from a machine. And no offense to any machines out there, not that you're my intended audience, but machines do not have the sense of quantum observership. A paintbrush that comes out of your mind that ties together moments of reality where you become uh, in, in aesthetic force. You become the artist making reality happen. Machines don't do that. So that's not some kind of a cruel trick from a horrible, capricious, mean overlord. Um, Roger says, in my understanding, the zeroth dimension equals unmanifest, first equals core of earth, second equals elemental realm, it's the alchemy of the nine dimensions, Barbara Hancloud. That is fine for her language, and if your understanding fits with that, that's fine, but I'm not using that type of understanding or that language in that way in any way here in this class. Again, I'm not casting aspersions upon the validity of her work. I don't know her work. That is fine, but that's like saying like an eighth of a teaspoon in Great Britain might be a different measurement than an eighth of a teaspoon in the United States. These measurements are for lasagna. I'm giving you lasagna measurements, so if I use the word zeroth dimension understand it through the filter that I'm creating here within this particular rarefied environment, but my, the, because the, the zero dimension, it's not unmanifest. It's both manifest and unmanifest. And this is where we get into this crap where it's just Tower of Babel crap. It's too much flapping of the moving mouth parts. So there are a million other teachers out there and there are a lot of math people too that will talk about dimensions in their own way. Please allow them to speak about their, through their own in cultural interpretation. But here in lasagna class, this is why I'm going through so much to say, like, I am very clear when I say this, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, establishing terms. This is what you do in the beginning of a, a math equation. A equals this, B equals this, C equals this. If A equals B equals C equals, then D must equal this. That's how I, I do it around here. Um, Jeffrey says, with the Mandela effect, for anyone who's new, or who never has watched a YouTube ever, Mandela effect is the perceived retroactive ripple in time, retroactively changing things, either events, evidences, or memories. Jeffrey says, are we changing our past on the same timeline or jumping to another timeline as a result of different choices of consciousnesses? Awesome question. I love you, thank you. And my answer is we are jumping timelines. So that is the best way to say it. As we are realigning our chakra system, timelines and bundles of energy from being askew to being perfectly in alignment over here, what's happening is we're changing the needle on the record, but not the songs that are actually recorded on the record. So here's the needle of awareness playing on the record of your life. I have a whole song about this. And uh, the periphery songs are crap because they end in death. But as you circle towards the middle, you get onto better timelines. 
So the crap songs still exist, but you don't have to actually play them over and over with your awareness. And when you get to do flying rainbow lasagna, that means you can actually lift the needle off of the songs that you don't like and go directly to the songs that you do like. So I would perceive Mandela effect as recognizing that we have lifted the needle off of the song that is playing in reality, gone to a new track on the record. On this new track, there might be something manifest that wasn't there before. A uh, uh, new disease, a uh, lack of a disease, a new hotel, a building that's appeared, a building that's disappeared, whatever it is, you're in a new world. But that doesn't mean that you took an eraser and erased everything away from the old world. The old world still exists, but you ain't there anymore. You jumped. Needle off the record, needle back on the record. Um, Mini Mantis, so the Mandela effect starts in the sixth dimension, and why is it happening now or at all? So my real interpretation of that Mandela effect is that this is the end result of you and me and many others awakening and to, become, to turn on the Large Hadron Collider. That's you and me. We're actually doing it. Quantum observership, paintbrush of your mind. We are actually using the digital realm as a realm of pure self-expression. And, um, there, and there are, of course, beings who want to hijack that. Hold on, let me just drink a little bit. There are beings who want to be like, no, humans, you are small and puny. You cannot possibly be transforming the world with your mind or quantum observership. A computer's doing it. So there's a lot of people who want you to acquiesce your power instead of claiming it and saying, it's me, I'm doing it. I'm doing it with my, with my very own brain up here. To say like, no, it can't be me, I'm too stupid. It's got to be some AI in some lab somewhere. So I think that that serves an agenda that it's very, um, people are very happy to, to say to you, uh, yeah, don't believe in your own power. And a lot of people will, will take you up on that. Like, yes, I will, I will not believe in my own power. It's AI somewhere. But I think it's not an AI somewhere. I think it's you and me. And I think when we actually claim that, we're like, wait a minute. If I'm making this happen with my mind and I'm changing and transforming reality and I'm transforming the past and I'm transforming the present and I'm transforming, you know, the reverberations into the future, then the next logical conclusion is I can fly in green bullets on you or basically use my imagination to consciously control reality. The Green Lantern Ring. Don't watch the movie. It's a stupid movie. Don't waste your time. But the concept of having a ring that gives you uh, the powers of pure imagination, like this is what it is. Eleanor says, uh, Aurora, sorry, but in explaining the building of the dimensions, you say that the fourth dimension is time. Is this according to current science, which you're explaining of the building of the, di of the dimensions? So my description does coincide and overlap with science's description. Science would also say that the fourth dimension is time and that time is also expressed through the higher dimensions. But like once you get into higher dimensional science and math, a lot of it is just done in math, not in the verbal description of, because these are Babylon. This is a uh, distortion. So th the science will begin talking about all these things just as um, numbers that fit together. So what I'm trying to say is science understands and describes some aspects of time, but they describe it through Braille, not through actually seeing it, but through feeling it. Being like, okay, like I'm feeling along. This has got to be this way. This has got to be this way. This has got to be this way. Like an inchworm, inching along the surface of time, not as a person who has their higher faculties awakened, who sees the map of time and knows what all of these things are. So they're like, I hold the door open, build a bridge. You know, I, I would love to tell science all about these things. And like I was uh, telling you about the work of Dr. Gates and the Adinkras, uh, science is beginning to understand that um, vectors and force can be described as a physical object like a, a like this and um, that I'm just I have a lot of um, my mind is drifting because I want, just want to say so many things in the moment that that is one way that we can describe math as a shape and once you understand math can be a shape and you understand more about the shape of time but I got to get more to the shape of time I only have like nine more minutes let me go for more questions Minimans is so time does not exist since we do the animation. Time is a perception by us. Time absolutely exists. Time absolutely exists. I don't know. I, I've been meeting these hippies lately. They're just like, it's okay. Time doesn't exist. Time exists. These are the grooves on the record. These are the grooves on the record. The record is down here. It's a record like this. It's a, it's a vortex going around the time vortex. Time exists. It's a very real thing. The possibilities and probabilities of time exist. So that's like saying we have musical notation, dots on a staff that represent notes, and then we also have the actual notes that I would play on my piano. If my piano were actually functioning right now. I don't know why it's not functioning. I should stop just even trying to refer to it. Pedro says, I think time is the first dimension, then come the physical dimensions. Nope. Physical dimension is first, second, and third dimension, and then time is fourth and up. Pedro says, time puts in order the physical cube so the story makes sense. Pedro, I think maybe you're describing more 
the non-physical matrix of energy that is like the substrate upon which the molecules of reality are arranged. And I would not call that time, but that's a very real substantive higher dimensional world too. Matthew says, our old text, the first movement as separation from God or separation from source, fall from grace, referring to the first moment of, of first dimensional creation, or is that the moment of hijacking? So this is a really great question. Thank you. I love you, Matthew, because fall from grace. This is the human biblical allusion to the idea that there were these horrible, poopy former angels who decided to just separate, separate themselves from God, right? Hold on a second. Be like, Hey, God, screw you. I'm out of here. I'm just going to separate myself from you. And that's different than this idea of the super dense overlapping zeroth dimension that in a very positive way decides to separate some of itself or go on an exploratory mission. Two very different attitudes. One is, hey, God, screw you. Like, I'm getting out of here and I'm going to throw a Molotov cocktail behind over my shoulders so that you die too, right? And then the other one is, I am a loving higher dimensional, zero dimensional creature. And I love myself. And I love this little piece of myself that's over here that's separated from me. I'm on an exploratory mission. What happens if I put this little piece of me over here and then make, make a connection between these two places? These are two different attitudes. One is very loving and can, can be like, like, what happens if I play these notes? What happens if I you know, bounce this basketball? Like, what happens in reality? I want to explore. Let's find out. I'm always in this class affirming and reaffirming to you that you're allowed to explore. Like you're allowed to make a charcoal sketch. You're allowed to play around on the piano, see how it sounds. If it sounds crappy, erase it, you know, erase, erase with a physical eraser, but don't be afraid to explore. So these, um, this cultural interpretation of the fall from grace, the fall of angels, that somehow exploring um, a material reality is, a ne is necessarily a voluntary screw you to God or a fall from grace. I don't embrace that at all. Just to be really clear, I'm not sure if my words made it clear. Not a biblical literalist. I'm speaking through this human cultural filter to try to bring you information. So I'm aware that there's this presumption of the horrible poopy angels that fell from grace that said, screw you to God. And the kind of the sense of like going away is bad and wrong. But you can't say that because think about like if you're a, a 18 or 21 year old, you've lived with your parents in a tiny little mountain village for however many years and you come to maturity and you're like, I want to go and look at, look at the world. I want to explore things. Like I want to have adventures. Like that's positive. You want fresh nutrients and fresh socialization and all the things that, you know, give, build your muscles into the person you wish to be. That's appropriate because otherwise we would have to say, well, zero dimension was bad and wrong and poopy for wanting to stretch itself out into the first dimension, created all of this suffering just by all of its, you know, self-centered poopiness. Like, no, the zero dimension should be allowed to expand into the physical materiality and explore itself and have wonderful experiences. We were all meant to have these wonderful experiences in an undying way without suffering, without having to be cut off from the divine. So the, this, the, the distinction between these two things. So no, the, the hijacking came much later. It is possible to have a healthy one, first, second, and third dimension. That's the whole point. The first, second, and third dimension these are not synonymous with ill higher dimensional health. These are not like symptoms of something that's not supposed to be there. We're supposed to have the dimensions, but we're supposed to have healthy dimensions. And so these dimensions were created and then hijacked. So Gallus says, so if my needle, needle of awareness is on one timeline, is there another part of me in a frozen point in a time frame? Yes. There are lots of other different versions of you. Every single one of us has a whole periphery of selves. There are 10 million versions of me and Cheeky that went out for our walk this morning and got like hit by a truck or someone, whatever, a flamethrower came out of a helicopter. Like there's all of these great unlikelihoods where we were incinerated or whatever happened to us. Clearly that's not this, you know, area of the time field. I pick up my needle of awareness off of the grooves where I'm incinerated and I put it over here where I come home and have a nice breakfast and, uh, you know, finish up my work here and Cheeky gets a little chew toy. That's the level of reality that I'm on. And you don't have to be afraid and feel fear and be like, oh no, what if I could walk outside in the morning and get incinerated? It ain't going to happen if you are in charge of where your needle of awareness goes. If you don't want to get incinerated, don't play that song. Don't play the fire song on your record. Play a better song. Sorry, I'm knocking stuff over. Um, Matthew says the texts are the hijacking probably... Um, I'm not sure if I, I'm, because I went by in conversation, so I'm not sure what that is in reference to. 
Um, Mini Man says, is it true that the fifth dimension is neutralizing toxic stuff and like chemtrails? Oh my God, thank you for asking me this. This is just a mini rant that has to happen. Usually I don't do this in the middle of class. But no, no, the chemtrails are not your friends. And this is hugely, hugely troubling to me. This is like saying that, that QAnon is telling you, oh, don't worry about anything and just sit on your couch eating potato chips because secret military tribunals are happening behind the scenes. You just don't know about it. So now, look, for a long time, people were like, oh, wait, Trump is in office. We'll know that things are okay when I see no more chemtrails in the sky. Instead of using that as the very, very high bar that needs to be jumped over, now everyone is just lowering the bar and saying like, oh, QAnon said that now the chemtrails are good and now the chemtrails are my friend. And so now just because you're seeing chemtrails, it doesn't mean that the good guys aren't in, aren't in charge or the good guys aren't actually good or the good guys aren't inept. It means that now the chemtrails are good. Like, do you even uh, look, see the distortion, the distortedness, the twistedness? Like, I'm having difficulty even putting this into words, it makes me so, my head wants to explode in reference to these assertions. So basically, um, no, chemtrails are not your friends and are never your friends. So please, if, you know, if, I'm a, if I'm a benevolent extraterrestrial, I would not say, I know, you've all been gassed unto death for the past you know, 12 or 15 years. I'll fix it all with more chemicals. Like, no. No, no, no. Like that's like the analogy would be like this. Like, let's say whatever, you have some profound disease and you've been having all the chemical uh, pharmaceutical treatments from the doctors and you're at death's door. And then is the solution more chemicals or is the solution like something that's natural and that comes from a plant and that's totally soothing and uh, nourishing for your body? That's what I would say. So yes, no, chemtrails are not your friend. No one is spraying benevolent chemtrails. And I think that you should have serious questions about who brought that assertion to you and why do you believe that like everyone is super skeptical of all this other stuff everyone is like i go i want I'm like give me flying the lasagna they're like let me see that i'm gonna read the label like what's in this lasagna like you're looking at me like i'm gonna try to put some kind of craziness into lasagna but you're ingesting these other ideas that willy-nilly that are like Duh! I mean, like, it's, it's worse than flat earth. I literally think that if you believe in benevolent chemtrails, that it is worse than flat earth. And if you know me, my ideas about flat earth, it's an infestation. So, okay, that's all. rant over, rant over. And I have a lot more material to get through. Um, Pedro says, if we transform the past, do our memories change too? Yes. Or do we remember the past we lived and then we get the new memories from the changes we made? You remember an overlap. Wait, 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 let me get a chair for my boss. Come on over, come on over, baby. <laughs> I don't mean to stop the uh, information because this is important information a boss might need to participate too at first you have an overlap uh juggling both realities and it's kind of like this let's say that you have a scar like you were in an accident you have a scar you heal yourself profoundly to the point where you can make it so that there's no more scar there's no more evidence that you had that injury you literally have picked up your needle and moved on to a different timeline where your body is different do you still remember that you once had a scar. Initially you do. Hey, I remember that I used to have a scar there. Now I don't have a scar there. At a certain point you will kind of, um, the, the vestigial traces of that first memory will kind of fade away and all that you will remember are yourself as a healthy and whole person. This goes for any rape, trauma, abuse. First you are healed of the trauma. Then, and you have a memory. Hey, I remember not being healed and now I remember being healed. I have a contrast between these two states of being. Then at a certain point, you embody the healed state of being so much that you totally don't focus on this at all. It kind of fades away, fades away to the point that you no longer focus on it. You no longer formally acknowledge it. And it does not define or limit your existence in any way. Um, uh, time is um, metabolic, like it has metabolism and it transforms just like our body. Our body is metabolic and it transforms dependent upon what you do with it. Get time muscles. I call these my lasagna muscles. Get time muscles. That's what healing in time is actually about. Thank you for that question because I think that was a really important topic to open the door on. Mini Man says, I thought time exists only subjectively since it needs the quantum observer. Time exists um, empirically um, outside of observership. Um, and that's what the higher dimensional, like sixth, seventh, eighth, et cetera, and up viewpoint is like. Jeffrey says, are the changes in past from a new timeline deliberate or chosen versus some byproduct resulting of jumping timelines? Hold on a second. Let me read it again. Are the changes in past from a new timeline 
deliberate or chosen versus some byproduct resulting of jumping timelines? That's a good question. I would say it depends on whether you're a virtuoso. Like if you're a flying rainbow lasagna virtuoso, then you can say, I specifically like, I want a flying rainbow lasagna this situation and change it. I want to put very specific strokes of red and green here. I want to paint something specific. Um, that's how you can do your jumping. Some people are just jumping willy nilly. And so I would say that their, their changes are not intentional. Okay, how do I do my changes? This is a better way of saying it because I I, it's hard for me to talk about other people. Let me tell you how I do my changes. I eat a hearty breakfast. I sit in my chair outside in the sun gaze and get lots and lots of energy. So I'm filled up with lots and lots of energy. Um, I certainly am intellectually aware of all the things that I would like to change in the world, both in my own life and in uh, larger physical reality. But I don't sit there and make a laundry list. Like, got to do this and got to do this and get a new teapot and, you know, it, it solve, solve the problems of the world. That's not what I do. But I'm aware of all of the, that laundry list of problems. And then what I do in order to address the laundry list is get into a higher dimensional mind state that is uh, directly connected to abstraction. So instead of being egotistical Aurora, which is nothing bad about that, but it's just smaller, more constrained, I go into non-egotistical expanded levels of higher dimensional self and actually work with the time field directly. That's like instead of saying to the symphony, like you louder, you softer, you know, stop playing tuba, you know, play a C sharp over here. Instead, what I do is I actually write, rewrite the dots on this musical score and we write new songs on the musical score, Xerox them and hand them out to all the musicians and then reality changes. So often I'm surprised by what happens. I change some black dots on the musical score and then I go out and I look around and I'm like, hmm, what's different? I'm like, oh, that's interesting, that changed. I didn't know that would change in that way. So the, I work on the abstract level and then see the uh, anthropomorphic reverberations or manifestations that, that come out. So I, I, I would say that is an effective way of doing things. Um, it's, my, it's, it's my way of doing things. There, there are many different approaches. Um, oh, wait, so and more from Jeffrey. He says, for example, for me, Ed McMahon was 100% the spokesman for PCH in the 19, 1990s, but I'm looking to understand how recognizing this change applies to my timeline choices that have resulted in recognizing the change. My apologies. No, it's not, it's not off topic. So you're talking about Publishers Clearinghouse. I remember this too. So uh, it, uh, some people would say, okay, we have overlapping memories. That means we must be from concurrent timelines. It's like Bernstein versus Berenstein versus Berenstain. I will tell you, it is not Berenstain. It's never been Berenstain. It has always been Bernstein. I have a, a you know, old friend who's named Bernstein that we always joked about this. But here's also what you need to think about. Almost nobody does their research by doing actual physical research anymore. Almost everybody does their research by doing an internet search. And it is so unbelievably easy to manipulate physical objects through Photoshop or it, it, manipulate Im images of physical objects through Photoshop and manipulate digital files to make it appear as if a change has happened that hasn't actually happened. Everybody does their research on freaking YouTube and on Google. They can do an image search for Bernstein bears and it comes up Bernstein. You say, oh look, it's the Mandela effect. I'm sorry if this sounds condescending, but you need to like find physical objects. Be a real Nancy Drew. No one's being Nancy Drew. Everyone is being like super lazy sitting on the couch and doing their digital long distance homework in this way. So if you really want to research, um, like it's just so easy, you just have to be more skeptical. Um, what am I trying to say? Someone said, um, it's not, you know, Luke, I'm your father. It's no, I'm your father or whatever it is. So what you'd have to do is not research through an, um, something like YouTube where it would be very easily, uh, easy to change those things digitally. You'd have to find an actual original film strip of the movie from the 1970s and play it on an original apparatus and see what the audio said. Like that would be real research. So um, in, in checking out Publishers Clearinghouse, like, how would you actually find that? You know what? Like, go to some guy who hoards TV guides and get something from, like, the 1990s. And, you know, they're all, or, like, whatever. If you find the magazine inserts, like, they're out there. So what I'm trying to say is I think what a lot of people think of is Mandela Effect is actually um, misremembered and misperceived and um, that people are being manipulated uh, into believing and agreeing that these changes in time are happening. Hold on a second. Sometimes changes in time are happening that is valid, but sometimes all that's happening is evidence is being manipulated. Okay, wait, wait. Um, 
Pedro says chemtrails don't, and Robert says chemtrails don't exist in my timeline. I think that's more of an affirmation of a, a, existence, a world he would like to live in, I think. And Sharon says, I don't think there are chemtrails in my part of Canada. If not, then I'm happy for you. Oh God. Um, Robert says, but the real chemtrails are flying from low level airplanes over our crops. Definitely there are, I mean, there are glyphosates and things like that that are sprayed over farms all the time, but we're also talking about like black goo, mycoplasma, metallic nanoparticles, self-assembling Tesla wetware, like that's what we're really talking about here. Um, Mini Man says, I don't believe the fifth dimension is doing that. I just read this today. If we can change timelines, this could be possible. I wish we could neutralize toxic stuff. Okay, well, I mean, it, it, not through the objective materialist viewpoint, it is not possible to neutralize these toxic things. However, through the higher dimensional understanding, it is possible to work directly with consciousness in order to heal chemtrails, but you got to get to be a really good musician to do that, okay? And I think that it's very clunky and disingenuous to say, I simply wave my magic wand to declare chemtrails to be my friend. Like, no, you know something? That is BS. And I think that it's just like when someone's like, look, I wave my magic wand and poof, you're healed. Like, no, it's not actually a healing unless your pustules disappear. Like someone, do you understand guys? Like you're being taken for a ride. Someone is waving their magic wand and saying, poof, I healed your chemtrails, now give me money. It's like, but look, we still have weeping sores and we still have pustules. And it's like, no, those are happy pustules now. I'm just relabeling them happy pustules. Like this needs to stop, I'm sorry. And everybody needs to be like, seriously, get your series of discernment and skepticism together. Um, something is happening in your mind if you are not able to make this obvious perception. I'm like, I'm like, I, I, I actually don't know. Like, I'm like, I don't know what is the, like why people believe in something that seems to me so obviously a deception and they lie. I think is our people's mentalities impaired in some way. It's almost like if people are drunk or tripping, like people become highly suggestible is what I'm trying to say. Why would someone believe that? If I said to you like, here, eat this cupcake, you know, it's full of rat poison. You should be like, I will not. It's full of rat poison. Like why, why is it so easy for people to be convinced? Like, yes, the cupcake full of rat poison is actually your friend. Um, Allison says, could you tell us what dimension the geometries exist in, like in your paintings? Um, okay, so um, the geometries exist in a higher dimensional reality beyond the spatial dimensions of first, second, and third dimension. That's the best way I can say it, a higher dimensional, multi-dimensional reality, but not in one particular dimension. So there is not a, ge a dimension of geometry itself, like a, like a dimension where it lives, um, there's a very good movie that's in my supplemental homework list for this class called Flatland that I highly encourage everyone to look into. Flatland is not real. There's not a place where people are actually make like little triangles and, and cubes and everything like that. Um, hold on. Okay. Two more questions. Let me get to more important information. Eleanor says, I had not understood, realized that the first dimensions were actually physical. Uh, the very leap from the zeroth dimension to elsewhere and the creation of the first dimension would be creation of time. Would be the creation of time and physicality. Exactly. Space and time. Space and time didn't exist when the zero dimension was all collapsed in on itself. And Sharon, Sharon says, it was Bernstein Bears. Exactly. Thank you. Bernstein. When my kids were little and she has left over their childhood says, oh, so that's interesting. She says everything she, that is left over from their childhood now says Bernstein. That's an interesting change in your own life. Uh, movie homework list is on my YouTube channel. It's called Supplemental Homework Videos and the movie is called Flatland. Let me go back to the whiteboard. This is all important stuff. So now I have to do, I know that I'm going super long, super long in my class here, but I gotta clear it all out. So we did building the dimensions, but now I have to do building the dimensions in this shape. Got it? Start off with the convergence point here. And the convergence point, when it reaches out and makes a line, the line is a curved line. It's a hula hoop like this, all right? So that was the zeroth dimension. That's the first dimension. I'm going to erase those two numbers. Then when we build the time plane, what we do is we take many, many of those flat hula hoops and fit them together and make them into a sphere. So what I'm using now is the magic of perspective to draw these ellipses to make it look as if this is a sphere, lines of latitude and longitude. Not that perfectly drawn, but it's supposed to look like a globe, like a round, you know, volumetric being. And that's made from many, many flat hula hoops that all go together. And you could even think of this as a spin because we start off with a dot, but then I make it spin around like this. And then I take that hula hoop and I make it spin around like this, making this shape over here. So keep thinking of this as how do we make this chakra shape by spinning? 
because we spun, we spun, and now we have a sphere, and now we're gonna spin the sphere around in a circle like this. And when you do that, that is where you get the torus shape. So now I would draw that, like, imagine that we have many, many multiple overlapping spheres, right? And that that is what makes, that's drawn horribly, but you know where I'm going with this, that's what makes that initial torus shape. I'm highlighting these in red so you can see what I'm talking about. And then the final spin that we do is making it spin end over end. That would be kind of like going in this direction here, end over end, kind of a go tumbling over like that. Uh, and what happens when you do that is this spot right here and this spot right here and the complementary spots over here spin around and create a circle that is a complementary vortex. I don't know if you can see this. I'm trying to choose a different color. You can see complementary vortices here and here. And that is what makes these other aspects of the full chakra shape. This is made out of time. So all of this is made out of nothing more than the whirling and twirling time, time whirling and twirling amidst itself. Now I have to talk about the pathways of energy through the time field. So these pathways right here, like this is birth over here where we're starting out down here, and that is analogous to this plane over here, or this plane, or this plane, or this plane. That's the starting point, right? And again, pathways of energy, these are all spirals, but if I were to draw it as spirals, heads might explode, it might be too difficult to see. So I draw them as simplified lollipops, starting off here at the moment of birth, and then moving upward here until they reach the membrane of death, which flows like a waterfall from the convergence point, the zeroth dimension flows like a waterfall down to here. So what you're seeing is, there are pathways of energy. Look, there's a circular pathway of energy that, wait, I should draw it in the same way, flows like a waterfall you got it and then it goes all the way up around here and then look what it does wow man now that waterfall is flowing quote unquote uphill from the opposite direction so you need to understand a couple of basic precepts here every road is a two-way highway so this thing flows away from the the convergence point but there is also a pathway that is flowing to the convergence point, two-way highway, and it's even a multi-lane highway, it's the membrane of death. Um, um, uh, am I getting, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm definitely over my time. Um, one more very important feature in understanding this before I wrap up for today is this central core timeline. That is the timeline of infinity. It is the timeline that where you are on, where you never have a break in your continuity of consciousness. So what I should focus on is the idea that this time, this time vortex is like the record of your life, like a Led Zeppelin record. You start off out of the periphery and you begin to explore moving, you know, more and more and more towards the center, towards this tent pole in the center. And as you do that, you have many, many multiple lives in, within the same life. So this also gets to Danielle's question. Ah, Danielle, blah, blah, blah. Your first question was, and this is for our lovely classmate who had to leave early, so I'm doing this as a recording, you'll catch it later. First question was about concurrent lifetimes. So uh, she wanted to know, are we experiencing concurrent lifetimes? Are we experiencing serial, like linear lifetimes? We experience concurrent lifetimes with each, with each one of these vortices being a particular life. And then within one life, we have a million lives. Not even a million, it's, uh, 10, 10 trillion, because you start off over here, reach the membrane of death and have to circulate back around. Start off over here, reach the membrane of death, circulate back around. Always having to keep on doing these endless loops and it doesn't just happen from one side, it's cross sections happening from both sides. It's like Groundhog's Day. It's like the movie Groundhog's Day where you need to repeat over and over, but with slightly different variables, the same life choices. Or like the books called Choose Your Own Adventures, where do you do this? Turn to page three. Do you do this? Turn to page 29. And the um, analogy I also use is pressing every wrong note on the piano before you finally learn how to read music and press the right note. The right note is going up this central convergence point um, um, timeline that is the timeline of perfection and ascended mastery. So the, the hack that Miniman and so many others, um, you know, rue and uh, rail against 
the hack is that we have to explore all the wrong notes. We're not supposed to have to explore all this crap that I'm highlighting right now in dark gray. They get a different color. You're not supposed to have to explore all of this crap in green. You're not supposed to actually listen to these songs. These are crappy songs. These are crappy songs where you get, your head gets bitten off by an alligator or you die in 10 million other more boring ways. You know, you die of cancer, you die of amputations, you die of whatever. None of those are interesting timelines. There's only one interesting, cool, fun timeline, and that's this timeline right here. And it's a timeline of infinity or continuity of consciousness where you never end, you never stop. So here, like you're knitting a sweater, knitting a sweater, knitting a sweater, oops, you die, your sweater gets unknitted, you come back to the beginning, you try it again, you have these breakages. The only timeline that you're on where there's no breakages is this central timeline where you remember, ah, this is where I'm coming from, this is what I experienced, this is where I'm going to, and then see ya, I'm out of here, I've metamorphosed into a new higher dimensional reality experience. And that's when you enter into a new, you know, vortex that's like shaped like this. And you go up the center of that new vortex. All right, you got it. So I had to do a little bit of fast presentation there. I know that was a little bit fast for everyone, but I wanted to really get that in. Um, Jeffrey says, my experience with the Bernstein bears is the same. The physical books on the shelf that I have for my kids have changed. I find that very interesting. So that is, you know, validation and good research that something has actually changed. Angel says, does the recent push for legalizing smokable marijuana a part of making people more suggestible? As far as I understand it, most of the medical effects are from ingesting cannabinoids. Uh, cannabinoids are what medical effects come from in cannabis. These include both THC and CBD. They have an effect in making people more suggestible, but I don't think that's what cannabis pushing is, is you know, or legalization efforts are about. Uh, what I think is making people so freaking suggestible is magnetism. That um, this can be understood in terms of a study that was done where transcranial magnetism was experimented on human subjects and it found them to be not only more suggestible, but more accepting of morally dubious outcomes. So the way that the exploration was structured, people were asked to read like a fictional short story where something morally dubious happened, like, you know, character A, character B, and they're planning a heist, and then in the end, instead of like getting arrested and going to prison, they kind of both, you know, have a fist fight and end up with half of the diamonds and go off and live on an island separately. Like that's like, that's a morally dubious outcome. That's not clear, very clear, right and wrong. The people that had had their brains exposed to these um, high magnetic fields, they accepted the morally dubious outcomes. And the people that didn't stayed in their sense of like uh, ethics and morals and they weren't so easily suggested. And they were like, no, that's wrong. That's not what's supposed to happen. That's what I think is going on. I think the magnetism comes from extrasolar bodies, from uh, you know astronomical, actual physical plan planetoids or planetary bodies that are moving through our solar system right now. And I think that yes, it's part of a change of the ages. It is like part of a you know natural cycle, you could call it. But it also is making everybody. It, what the magnetism does is it makes the DNA more malleable. You could believe anything. You you could become anything. In some ways, that's really wonderful because you could become your greatest vision of your higher self, but you could also think stupid things and be like, like if somebody gives you like a magic pill of where you're, what you imagine, you know, comes truthful and you imagine like something stupid and morally dubious, then you are making that thing come become truthful. But I would not encourage you to use the magic of your magic pill on that. Um, Minnie Man says, how do I get to the central timeline ASAP? The answer to that is through your own process of virtuosity and self-cultivation. And I teach people a lot of the tools as to how to do that in this class, but it is as always your own steam power that makes you run on the marathon. And Red says, is all, it's also 440 hertz tuning and television programming and flicker rates artificial lights. Oh, dude, man, you totally get it. Thank you very much, Red. Yeah, so for everything that we are trying to do in terms of natural uplift and transformation of consciousness, of conscious, uh, transformation of consciousness, there are 10 million different obstacles that are intentionally placed in our way saying, no, I don't want you to raise your consciousness. Here's a bunch of why fry signal or whatever muckola coming from uh, television, everything smart meters, artificial lights. I absolutely, I hate fluorescent lights. Yes, they are very horrible. So all of these things um, inhibit our natural capacity, what, what our natural unfoldment is. That if we didn't live in these boxes with all the EMF fields and you know horrible fluorescent lights and other things that are um, having an impact on the natural functioning of our bioenergy field, 
our ascension process would be super much easier. And I talk about this too, we're in unprecedented times and like the Buddha, Siddhartha of the year 500 BC, he didn't have to deal with chemtrail crap. Well, it looked like that was easy back then. Like they just had rice. They didn't have GMO rice. You didn't have to worry about any of this stuff. We are in unprecedented times. So our journey is uh, hugely challenging. And also you get a lot of help, so don't worry. So wait, let me stop the recording for right now. Let me move on to level two. This is gonna be a long upload. Thank you very much for all the patience and thank you for your wonderful questions. So hold on. <laughs>